What are you missing right now in your real estate marketing efforts? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Stay tuned. This episode of Keeping It Real is brought to you by Real Geeks. How many homes are you going to sell this year? Do you have the right tools? Is your website turning soft leads into interested buyers? Are you spending money on leads that aren't converting? Well, Real Geeks is your solution. Find out why agents across the country choose Real Geeks as their technology partner. Real Geeks was created by an agent for agents. They pride themselves on delivering a sales and marketing solution so that you can easily generate more business. Their agent websites are fast and built for lead conversion with a smooth search experience for your visitors. Real Geeks also includes an easy to use agent CRM. So once a lead signs up on your website, you can track their interest and have great follow-up conversations. Real Geeks is loaded with a ton of marketing tools to nurture your leads and increase brand awareness. Visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod and find out why realtors come to Real Geeks to generate more business. Again, visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod. And now, on to our show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I am your guide and host through the show. And in just a moment, we're going to be speaking with Kurt Euler about some maybe some things you're missing right now in your real estate practice, especially around marketing. And we're super excited to chat with Kurt. But before we get to Kurt, just a couple of quick reminders. Please help us grow. A couple of things you can do to always support our show, which is number one, support our sponsors please 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 check out the products and services they offer um, we're so grateful to have sponsors they help keep our show going and you should help keep them happy by uh, checking out their services so please do that and then also just we ask one other thing which is tell a friend think of one other realtor that could benefit from listening to our show and send them a link over to our website keeping it real they can sample our episodes there actually they can listen to every episode we've ever done right on our website and then if they want to they can subscribe through whatever podcast service. So guys, please support our sponsors and please tell a friend. And boy, we're going to keep doing the show forever, hopefully. So thanks for being uh, such great supporters of our, uh, what we're trying to do here. Really appreciate it. It means the world to us. And now on to our interview with Kurt Euler. Today on the show, we have Kurt Mueller from Showcase IDX. Let me tell you, actually, Kurt does a lot more than just Showcase IDX. So let me tell you about Kurt. Now, Kurt Euler is a globally recognized marketer, operator, and speaker. He's a dynamic and charismatic speaker talking about marketing and innovation. His speaking experience includes speeches across the United States and Europe, in addition to presenting at prominent industry events such as PPAI, GDC, the White House, and private company team workshops. He advises leaders from startup founders to private equity-backed CEOs to the President of the United States. Kurt is a popular and entertaining commenter and has appeared on national television shows and periodicals, including Wired, TechCrunch, Thrive Global, USA Today, uh, WGN for all your local Chicago people, NBC, ABC, he's everywhere. Uh, Reach out to him, by the way, for a guest on marketing, real estate, or growing American-based business. He's built and run businesses from startups to over 500 million in annual revenue. He's assembled teams across six continents. He's been part of the small team leading an IPO, which went from $880 million, and he's participated in dozens of acquisition. Um, I think we've we've gone enough. I could keep going and talk about Kurt's accomplishments. Um, He also, by the way, runs Showcase IDX, which is a great IDX service for our audience. And boy, he he talks to associations. He does it all really to learn more about Kurt. He holds patents, by the way. Uh, he, he's just really done some incredible things. Go to his website, KurtEuler.com. That's K-U-R-T-U-H-L-I-R.com. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I couldn't ask for a better intro than that. I mean, my well, wife I had to cut. I had to cut it short. Him. Because I could have just kept going and I go, oh my God, I'm going to give 20 minutes of, uh, of, of your bio, which it's just so impressive. Um, we're really excited to have you on the show and, 
And you know what I love about about you, Kurt, I, before I even got to meet you, here's what I love. I, I love the fact that you're so organized and ready. Very rarely, just to pull back the curtain on, on our show, we get a lot of requests, of course, from people who want to be on the show. Um, what I loved about Kurt is a lot of times when we're coordinating with our guests, saying, let's come up with some talking points. Kurt sent us a list of talking points. Nobody ever, I've been doing this five or six years. You would think that would happen more often than it does. And it doesn't, we always have to extract that with Kurt. I got a whole list of great topics. So we're going to be speaking with Kurt about a lot of things, real estate, because he has a tremendous amount of industry experience and knowledge. But Kurt, I'd like to start all the way back at the beginning because you have done so many different things, but how did you get involved in real estate? Um, I have, I've been in marketing and higher growth technology companies for 15, 18 years or so. And about five years ago, a man named, uh, Alan Pinstein gave me a call and he's fraternity brother, hadn't met him though. And he's like, I heard through the grapevine that you talked to your wife and letting you take 18 months after, after exiting one of the companies you started. That sounds like a really difficult discussion. I just sold tour <laughs> buzz. Can we get coffee? And, and you talk me through what that looked like. Cause I might want to have that conversation. And he, uh, Tour Buzz was in the real estate space, but he'd had this other company, Showcase IDX, that uh, had been going since like 2003. And he told me about it. And um, I mean, cool, awesome technology compared to anything else. And so five days later, I met the CEO and we hit it off. And I was like, hey, let's go do this. Amazing. Well, t tell us about Showcase IDX a little bit. Yeah, so it's the leading home search uh, that agents use to build their own sites. And so, um, I mean, a lot of agents have misconceptions about IDX. Technically, it's just the feed that comes from your, your, your local association. But it's really, hey, it's the home search. It's all the tools that your, that your, your home buyers and sellers use on your website. That should be the foundation. And so, um, I mean, everybody uses us from Mark Spain, the number one listing agent in the country, to Patrick Higgins. We can talk about him in Nashville, Tennessee, to a whole bunch of small part-time agents. And so if, if you want to get organic growth, it's kind of the only game in time in town. Yeah. And so for anyone out there who isn't familiar with what an IDX data feed is, so all of us are, are members of likely our local association. It's how we get access to the MLS software. Of course, every local association, you know, uses their own um, software, uh, you know, there's different providers. So I, uh, you know, these association, you know, and for example, here in Chicago, we use one called MRED, um, downstate Illinois, these total, totally different systems. So when, when agents are looking to build a website for themselves, they'd love to be able to pull in the data from the MLS, just like Zillow, Redfin, any of the, the big national uh, companies that, that we think of when we think about um, home searches online. And so agents want that same functionality. So they, you know, anyone can build anyone a real estate website, but uh, to then incorporate a, a live search feature to pull in all those MLS listings so that when people visit your website, they can actually search for homes is what Showcase IDX does. And so they'll integrate with websites. You probably, I'm sure, build websites as well for agents. Um, so they they sort of do it all to make sure that you don't just have this online business card, essentially. If your website's just, hey, look at me, I'm a realtor, that's fine. But to actually add some functionality to so people who, who visit can actually search for homes, that's what Showcase IDX does. And so re really, really cool service. I, I would imagine anyone who's built a realtor, real estate website understands the importance of having an IDX feed. It, what I've always said too, and I'm curious, Kurt, just to get your opinion on this, a lot of times I think people go into an IDX relationship, so they build a website, they incorporate IDX into it. And then I think the expectation sometimes isn't always accurate for the agent who's just built this website. May They might think, great, I have this website. I now have the search feature. Where's all this traffic, right? And right. then, and then of course, maybe they're not getting the leads. And I've always said, I don't even know if that's the main point of, of having an IDX site because whether or not someone uses it, that's a whole different conversation because that's now we're talking about how do you drive traffic to that website, which is a totally different conversation um, and a much more challenging um, uh, objective. But I've always thought even if no one really uses it, which they should, but even if they don't, it still makes you look extremely professional. I think it's got to be there regardless of whether it becomes, you know, yeah. your your primary lead source or just something that I just think regardless, it looks really, really professional. 
No, I, I agree. I, th I think there, there's three reasons that somebody needs to have a site with, with a home search on it. The first is you, you're passing a vetting test. You don't, if you don't realize it before, before your client picks you, the average and NAR says it's not, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's usually people work with the first agent they find. All the yep. data I've seen actually says people talk to more than three agents before they choose their agent. So you're getting yep. vetted against at least two others. And if you don't have a, a, a site, you know, this person is going to call them from Zillow. So that, well, that's yep. a second agent in the mix of it already. So you pass a vet, vetting test to your point. It makes you look good. The second part to me is it's retention. And so, hey, there's one thing to get leads, but if I don't have a home search, it's not just having a search on my site. If I don't have a home search that my home buyers will actually use, then they're going to go to Zillow. And the only thing yep. I can guarantee in uh, in the industry is that if your clients go to Zillow, a competitive agent will be calling them knowing <laughs> what they're searching for and all their contact info, uh, plus a whole bunch of other people. But then the third part is there is a way to do lead gen with it, which a lot yep. of people, you're right, they don't, they think, hey, I, I spent $60, $100 a month to add this plug into my site. Why don't I have traffic? They don't follow the model that actually uses our technology to actually make that happen. Yeah. And, and I, and again, I, those, you know, those are really important things to think about because again, you're right. Uh, you know, the vast majority of home consumers are going to go to Zillow. So anything that you can do to capture a slight, a, a tiny piece of that traffic as an agent is, is huge because of course we know the way Zillow makes money is they sell leads. That's, that's their deal. And so, you know, to be able to pull that traffic and keep that in house. Um, but the challenge over the years has been how to do it in an elegant way and to have technology that rivals what, you know, of course, Zillow and Redfin and, and those companies have kind of mastered is this user experience. And what I like about Showcase IDX is you guys have gone pretty deep there and, and been able to create really functional uh, website, you know, integration so that pe when people visit, they're not, they're not having a a less than experience than if they go to Zillow or Redfin. They're basically having the same exact experience, if not even better. Um, so I'm I'm a big fan of, of what you guys do. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about about marketing because you know to have you on the show is is a real treat for us because of your breadth and and, and depth of of knowledge. Um, but let's talk about things that agents you know, aren't doing or, or that you feel are huge opportunities today, you know, from a marketing perspective, like what, what are some of the things that are on your mind? The, I mean, we the kind of two things. So one is, I mean, we you hear continually from, from, from the agents that are high performers, those top one percenters, the point one percenters that especially early on, and even often when they, they've hit real, tra uh, real transaction volume, need, their agents don't niche down. Hey, I'm in Roswell, Georgia. I own a lot of property in Blairsville, Georgia. Almost every agent I see online, whether they have a website or not, they're like, I help people buy homes in Roswell, as opposed to who helped my wife and I buy our home. It was the name, uh, Keller Williams agent named Bobby Lyerly. Bobby and two other agents trade leads back and forth because he helps married couples in their mid-20s to early 40s with young kids, pretty much to go to two large churches in the area. That's all those agents do. Singles? Well, Sorry, I don't help you with that because I don't know that demographic very well, he says. And but he's awesome for it. His I can't tell you how many transactions they do, but I mean, that's niche, that's what niching down looks like. Um, most agents just don't do it because they're scared when they have low volume about, well, I don't want to exclude somebody. And they don't realize, yeah, when you exclude people, you actually become a lot more attractive to the others. And and the other big thing that I think agents just aren't doing is they don't realize we're in the we're in an influence economy. And so I've mentioned before, agents are getting vetted. Hey, I'm choosing you whether you niche down or not. I'm choosing to work with you for certain reasons. And so, hey, you could be really big on TikTok and somebody talked you into that or Pinterest or whatever tool you're working on today. But all of those things we know historically change their algorithms. And so what happens if you don't have a digital hub, a website that to be able to funnel people back to, um, like you're basically peddling your interest on something that could go away literally tomorrow when the, the next algorithm changes. And so people don't realize it's an influence economy and you're in it, not just for today, but for the next 10 years. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, especially the, the sort of influence economy um, conversation, because I've always thought, you know, it's easy for, well, I shouldn't say easy. A lot of agents, I'll, I'll back up a step. So a lot of agents, I, I believe, think, you know, they're used to going on Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, maybe LinkedIn, wh whatever you were saying, you know, other platforms, TikTok, yeah. Pinterest, et cetera. And they're used to scrolling and being a consumer themselves of, of those of those services. So 
a lot of times they think, okay, well, I'll start promoting myself more on, on Facebook or, or wherever. And, and that's great and, and good. And you should have a strategy there. But if you actually look at the metrics, you know, even if you have your own business page on Facebook and you have, you know, followers, people that subscribe to it, you're probably only capturing, I haven't looked at data recently, but um, I think it's maybe every time you post, maybe three to 5% of that audience will actually right. see that post, right? So I, is that, that's sort it's of what- way you're less than that even now. Even but less, it, yeah. But that's an awesome thing because if you know what you're doing, you can reuse content. So if only 3%, even if it was 3%, I could theoretically post, like it usually is an overlap. I could post it 10 times and very few people will see the same post over and over. So if you know what you're doing, you can reuse a lot of your content. That's a really, really good point. And so, you know, for anyone listening to, to think about that, and, and I, and I suspect, I suspect Facebook understands duplicate posting. I would guess, I don't know for sure, but my guess is it wouldn't make sense for Facebook to 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 uh, show somebody, even if it's different posts, but the same content. I guess my guess is Facebook also makes sure they're not sending the same person a duplicate post. I don't know for sure. Um, I, I'm going to ask my friends at Facebook about that because what you're talking about is really important. This idea of you know re repurposing content. So if you have this great post, realize that even if you have a great response to it, maybe 3% of your audience saw it. So if you reuse it, um, you as, as the agent might sort of aesthetically, if you look at your feed go, I don't like the idea of posting something over and over again, but the reality of it is no one else is seeing that other than you. So the idea of repurposing it is, is really important. And of course you don't maybe post it right after, you know, the same thing 10 times right. in a row, but you, you have it on a rotation. I, I'm guessing is what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Facebook, you can't really schedule for anymore on personal profiles, but I mean, on everything else, it's like, you know, I actually use a tool called Missing Letter on my, for my personal things that will, I can put into a drip feed kind of like, hey, this is a big article. Like I wrote this massive article that's been covered all by all sorts of places on servant leadership. And, um, and so I put that into Missing Letter for a 400 day basically drip. So it'll go out on day one, day 32, day 90. And it like, it's basically good to go for like the non-personal profile stuff at that point. So I don't have to worry about touching LinkedIn again. It just works. Yeah. That's called missing letter. I'm that's not called familiar, so I'll have to check. I love and of it. course, very web 2.0. So they're missing a couple of vowels at the end, but <laughs> I love, of course that is that, you know, that's a really funny comment. Um, yeah. This idea of removing a vowel and making a company out of it. It's, it seems to be everyone's uh, idea of uh, the tech space. So I love that. Right. That is really, really a funny observation. Um, I can't, I can't, I I'm now thinking about all the things I subscribe to uh, different services where there's, there's a letter miss, there's a, a vowel missing in, in the company name. Right. Um, that's really funny. I, I want to ask you about, you know, just real estate agent business. So, you know, real realtors, uh, our listeners are either individual practitioners, you know, it's them, they, they do everything themselves, they wear a lot of different hats, then of course, there's a lot of people who listen, of course, that are on teams or are thinking of building a team or maybe joining a team. Um, but I want to talk about what real estate agents maybe are underutilizing. So I know we're, we're thinking a lot about, okay, the market has changed. Rates are up. Inventory is still pretty low. Most markets, um, realtors now who I guess are at the very top are, are breathing a little sigh of relief because they now have a little bit more free time than they did before. But people who are not at the top of the mountain are freaking out. Oh my gosh, it's really slow. This is bad. So I'm just curious on, on what you would coach or encourage somebody to do, you know, right now to help kind of, you know, keep their business rolling. I think mean, they're both keep their business rolling. And then where do you come out on the other side? I mean, I think, you know, we're all seeing this market slowdown. I mean, God knows what Q3 is actually going to look like, but I completely believe that like, we're going to see like what we saw like in 2007, the people that hit it hard in the next six to 12 months, that the, they're, they're, they're going to add zeros to their net worth when we're looking out two years and five years from now. And so this is the time to do, I think it's two things. One is, I mean, the main thing is, Agents aren't using their own wisdom. They're so focused on who's going to close a transaction today. If they are posting online, that's all of their content usually. Hey, here's a new listing. Here's a closing that I did. That's slowing down. Well, even if, even when it's still a five year turnover for a, you know in your market, the the chance that's you know of a hundred people that follow you, how many are active buyers? Like a very small percentage are actually active buyers. And so they don't think about what content is useful to people when they're not active, which will help me with referrals, but also make sure that they come back to me when uh, when they're ready for the next transaction. So 
Um, I kind of see the same data across uh, across all the agents that I, I'm able to look into tens of thousands of agent CRMs. But Agent Hub 360, a great partner that I that I know that helps agents kind of with the whole tech stack and everything. When we look in at like their their average customers and go, let's look at like the last six to ten tra closed transactions. The average window how long somebody has been in a CRM is like 17 to 27 months. So everybody wants the new lead from, from Zillow or from a pay-per-click ad, but the reality is the most of the people that are closing transactions, they've known the people they're working with for 17 to 27 months. Yeah. So I, I'm at a cocktail party or I'm, I'm, I'm out, you know, meeting people socially and I meet somebody and I think, okay, you know, Hey, by the way, I'm a realtor. And if, if you ever need any help, um, you know, I'd love the opportunity to work with you. And the person goes, okay, great. And then maybe you get their contact information. And so now you have somebody to add to your CRM, but also to think, okay, this person, I need to have a strategy to, to touch this person at, at some, you know, some frequency because they're prop for, for the next, we'll say two years, right? 17 to 24 yeah. months is, is the average. So yes, they're not, they're unlikely to buy tomorrow, but, or sell tomorrow, but, but maybe in the next two years. So realizing whenever you add people into your database that you have to have then a pretty serious follow-up or education of uh, sort of strategy so that you're touching them in ways. So you just said something that was and really tag them important. right away. Like you qualify them. Are they, are they an active buyer? And if not, you put them in a different category and you should treat them different. Cause if you hound me after we met at that dinner party or that barbecue, and I'm not even ready yet, chances are there's, a, if, if it's a, if it's a, a marriage or a partnership, there's usually one person who even gets ready two to three years. They're thinking about it before they even bring it up to their spouse. Well, if you hound either of those people, like they're an active buyer, you're almost gone with them. I want to pause for a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, our one of my favorite companies out there, Follow Up Boss. Now, after interviewing hundreds of top realtors in the country for this podcast, do you know which CRM is used by more than any other by our guests? Of course, it is Follow Up Boss. And let's face it, following up is the key to taking your business to the next level. Follow Up Boss will help you drive more leads in less time and with less effort. Do not take my word for it. Robert Slack, who runs the number one team in the U.S., uses Follow-Up Boss, and he has built a $1.5 billion business in just six years. Follow-Up Boss integrates with over 250 systems, so you can keep your current tools and lead sources. Also, the best part, they have seven-day-a-week support, so you'll get the help that you need when you need it. And get this, Follow-Up Boss is so sure that you're going to love their CRM that for a limited time, they're offering Keeping It Real listeners a 30-day free trial, which is twice as much time as they give everyone else. And oh, yeah, no credit card required. So you can try it risk-free, but only if you use this special link. Visit followupboss.com forward slash real. That's followupboss.com forward slash real for your free 30-day trial. Follow up like a boss with Follow Up Boss. And now back to our episode. Yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 it's it's it's. I always call it the um, what a lot of agents have done, and I, I don't mean to 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 diminish this or or to to you know be pejorative here in my in my comment. But a lot of times, people meet someone, they get their information, they immediately throw them on their newsletter, you know, and, and that's fine. Um, but that's again, as 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 Kurt's saying, that person might not be ready to buy today. They probably don't care about your newsletter today. That's not to say you shouldn't send it, but you should realize that the communication to that person um, who's like maybe two years out, uh, or maybe you don't even know how long out, really needs to be a different than the person who's like actively looking. And so you're talking about segmenting your your database and and your and your sphere of influence. Um, how do you continue to to touch the people that are, maybe two years plus out by giving them content that, yeah, they're not buying or selling today, but I still want them to know who I am and what I do. What are your suggestions for, for those people? Yeah. So um, there's a really easy one. If you have your own website with a home search, it doesn't have to be showcased. Um, that I, there's a sweet spot of you help somebody close a transaction from six months to 24 months ago, because any longer than that, one of those two people on the house might be starting to think about their next place already. But that sweet spot, you call them up with this, basically, do you want to know what's going on in your market? Especially now, hey, I can just sign you up for open house alerts so that you can see who's upgrading their bathrooms and kitchens when it comes up. If anything makes sense, let me know. Um, you, you, if, you, if you do it non-salesy, you can ask, hey, can I sign you up as well for new listing alerts in your neighborhood? 
or if it's a high rise, like in Chicago, like, you know, in your condo building or Miami or something, because what happens then is your referrals will go up by at least three X. I see a three to 10 X increase because you didn't try to sell them anything. It's you get, you're triggering the curiosity factor. This happens, works from big national brokerages down to an individual agent. And so when you get the listing uh, alert for the open house, what it keeps top of mind, it hurts my agent. I want to, I can call them if I ever need anything, but also when the, when the place comes up for sale and one of my buddies might want to be wanting to move the neighborhood, I just forward them the email, which brings them back to your website, not the MLS, not Zillow. And so that's how the referrals come. I I love that. I so so I'm a perfect example of as you were talking, I was getting excited and uh maybe even a little embarrassed that I hadn't thought of this because uh so I, I have a bought in a condo in a new development and everyone's moved in at this point. I think there's about 30 some units anyway. Um, I am fascinated by, um, at some point, you know, I won't live there. I'll probably live there another handful of years and then I'll move somewhere else. And I am curious, uh, always about, I wonder if the value of my, of my condo has gone up or down. Right. And, you know, one of the ways to determine that of course, is you could go to Zillow and look at the Zestimate and, and we, you know, that might be accurate. It might not. Or um, you could set up alerts to see um, open houses. Like I'm super interested in the first person in our building that will sell their property because that will affect the rest of us. So this idea of setting up alerts for the neighborhood, like you said, curiosity, it, what's yeah. going on in my and neighborhood? It's you're right, it's curiosity because agents tend to default to a CMA sign up, they'll sign somebody up for, but that triggers the, the logical side of the brain. My home is yeah. worth $400,000. The, what I said triggers the emotional and almost yeah. everybody makes decisions emotion wise about, uh, right. about, do I want to move? Do I want to sell? Hey, it may not change the value of my home, but if they're all upgrading their bathrooms, I want to upgrade my bathroom. Right. And that's what, that's what, heads, that's what keeps people in a relationship with you. And so that's a really easy way to do that. But you mentioned like the newsletter before the other thing for how do you get the relationship going for people that aren't active is you think about what's useful to them when they're not actively buying and selling. So I am of interest to your newsletter if your newsletter is actually done properly. 80 yeah. to 90% content for people that are not active buyers and sellers and 10% maybe for that for content. Like, I don't really care how many transactions you've closed. It's enough for a vetting thing. What I care about is, oh, Alive After Five, the, 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 the street festival that happens monthly in Roswell. Yeah. That's what I care about. What I care about is, hey, there's a new neighborhood going up over there uh, that's changing the traffic dynamics when I take my kid to school or go to church. That's stuff that's useful to me that will, will go, God, I remember you then. And I may even tell people about you. And even though I may not be buying or selling for five years. I, I love that. We we just um you, you're so so 100 percent right. So in our building, we have a um a Facebook private Facebook group for the owners. And most of the time, what we post on there is, hey, did you guys know this new restaurant? Just we just yeah. had a, a Jewish deli open up in our in our area. We don't have a Jewish deli. And so this is big exciting news for us. So there's this uh, new deli that's coming, and they'll have you know pastrami and corned beef and matzo ball soup and all, all the all the fun Jewish deli food. And people are so excited. Um, but the only reason we know about that is somebody told us. I didn't know. And yeah. and so this is a you're, you're so right. So if you think, oh my God, well, I work in every neighborhood in, in my local area. And I have a, you know, I live in Chicago or wherever where there's lots of neighborhoods. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to, to provide content like that to each segmented audience. But Kurt, you said something really important is like, if you niche down and like I live in a neighborhood called Wicker Park. You know, and you become not that you only have to work in Wicker Park, but if you become the Wicker Park guy or, or woman and you now are submitting content, everybody in Wicker Park wants that content. We all want to know, like you said, what when are the festivals, the street fairs, what's going on, may, maybe uh, politically or I'm segmented or down in my, I used to live in Damon and Division. I had a condo on Winchester. Oh, my gosh. 100 block. So uh, but even so, there, so that Chicago has all those little pocket neighborhoods. I would drive two, two and three miles, which is a long way in Chicago when I found yeah. out about a new cool little like uh, dog park that opened up somewhere else yeah. for my English bulldog too. So even though you can, if the if you if you have the capacity to niche down and just share that local content, the more you can do that, the better. But it's still also is very interesting for like it's. It, but you're thinking about I'm I'm writing this about what's going on in Wicker Park. But also like, hey, is it worth like part of the thing? Is it worth the 30 minute drive to get here? Like if you add that little bit, it's now interesting to somebody in Evanston. I love you are it, so absolutely right. right. I love but, that. But th so that's where you think about like, how do I just when I'm writing this, the pro and this is all marketing, all business. 
most people, I think, in business and what holds back from, from being just good marketing to exceptional is they write things that have been, are interest to them. Or they think yeah. it's just this, and they you don't. I literally take my glasses on and off sometimes and go, "All right, I'm Kurt. All right, I know nothing that's in Kurt's head right now. All right, and I'll reread my thing to go. All right, what do I know just from what is going on in my newsletter? And then go, oh, yeah. well, somebody that wasn't just in Wicker Park, would I add anything that would make this of interest? The answer might be no, but may not be possible, but I might be able to make that possible. Um, here in Ro Roswell. They built this river walk, uh, literally like a boardwalk along the Chattahoochee River. People drive an hour to come sure. and park at, at it and go through. And still, I mentioned things literally like the next street over Mar uh, or the next neighborhood over in uh, Marietta. And people go, what? I, they have no idea that this thing has existed for like five years, literally just next door when people yeah. are driving from south side of Atlanta to come walk along the Chattahoochee River. And you're, you're providing incredible value because most people, you know, they go to work, they, they have their weekend time and they want to know about what's going on. What can I do this weekend? What can I go and, and enjoy with my family by myself? Um, you know, what's going on in the community and let's face it, it's hard to know all of that. It's really a challenge for the, uh, you know, for the average, uh, parent or, or in, even individual, you know, single person to really know that. And that's where realtors can create tremendous value. Um, you you know, you can, you can be the person that's like, I, you know, subscribe to my stuff and I'm going to let you know about everything that's going on in, in this area. Fun, real estate wise, you know, uh, socially dining, all of that is, is such great value as you wait out those 24 months or, or longer before the person actually needs you. Yeah. Well, I mean, this thing, I mean, just as we write content thinking that, like, you know, assuming like people just know what we have, we we think what we know, especially as, as agents, is not of interest to people because I know it. And if I live in Wicker Park and you're an agent, well, when we talk back and forth, we know about all the same stuff, not realizing that, hey, my, my average, uh, you know, a resident doesn't know what we might go back and forth on. And so... We just got like, when you go, I'm, my, my job here is to serve people. And if I serve them well, then they will come back to me and they will see value in me. Um, so that's where I was like, yes, the two things. And it's like that second piece was just agents have all this wisdom and knowledge that they just need to convey and they need to split it like 80 to 90% for not active buyers. And sometimes it's stuff you can automate. You can write that article about street festivals in Wicker Park and why you should or shouldn't go to this, you know, to, to this restaurant. Well, th that's, that's automated kind of content because you can mass market it. You may also add notes and add a follow-up in. So like, Hey, when we bought this house, we had a uh, storage area that was stubbed out for a new bathroom. Now we, we approached our agent before this for there, and he gave us wonderful uh, insight about whether it could be valuable. When he sold me the home, he knew that he could have added that into a CRM and said, hey, follow up in 24 months to, uh, to ask if they'd like some insights about whether that would be a good investment to drop 30K on a new bathroom. That's an easy action to add. It gets it out of your brain. The CRM does what it's supposed to do. and But most agents just don't do that because they're like, well, I, they'll come back to me. No, that's a value thing. It's a different thing when you come to say, hey, we haven't spoken in a while. I just wanted to make sure that um, you knew if, if you dropped that 30K, you're going to get 45 out on the other side today. Yeah, definitely. And it's the same thing with like refinancing, which which I know the refinance market is, isn't quite what it was, but when it was booming, what Absolutely. a great opportunity for agents to reach out and say, hey, I don't know, you know, your mortgage situation currently, but I was thinking about you because rates are so low. Obviously they're not as low now, but, right. but back then, and you know, I was just wondering if if you had had a chance to talk to your mortgage person, it might be a good time. Again, what we're talking about is is refinance, or sorry, what we're talking about is, is providing value in between the transactions. And and so to think like what is the what is the home buyer or seller or owner want during the, that time? It's it's information that's of use to them. Um, so I, I you are at so absolutely right. Um, and you know it's like I almost think that people should have a specific a specific marketing track or follow up track after somebody buys their very first property, first time home buyers, because absolutely. we we know if, if you were if if all of us who own a property remember what it's like when we first bought our our very first property, it's. It's kind of like overwhelming to go, well, how often am I supposed to change the filters or what am what maintenance should I be doing? And this is where it, a great agent can come in and say, hey, congrats on your first home. Here's some things to know, you know, month one, month two, month three, and just continuing that. And boy, 
it's not crowded along that that uh going the extra mile right the path is not crowded with other agents doing that you you'd basically be alone um and they're going to be like wow my agent is staying in touch with me they you know i bought the property four years ago with them and i'm still getting good quality content well now yeah i agree with all that now this is what's in somebody's ear that's listening to us right now they're going yeah, but that's a lot of work to hope that person comes back to me in five years or eight years when they sell, which is true. Er, true, but also if if it, like my goal is not to make money, my goal is to help people, and so that's why I've been so successful in different industry. When that's your goal, it doesn't take energy to do that. But like on the more shorter term, here's for the for the agents that are a little more self serving that don't want to wait five to eight years to get that lead, that lead to come back to them after the transaction. If you want referrals, this is the best path to referrals. I'm going to refer you when you're top of mind. If I, you're my agent and I love the transaction, I couldn't have imagined a better agent five years ago. Somebody asked for a referral. I've never mentioned your name out of the last six months. That guy, Bobby, I mentioned, Bobby and my mortgage broker, because my mortgage broker here in, uh, in Roswell does the same thing. I have probably given them three dozen referrals on an annual basis each because they're doing the follow-ups that I'm talking about. Yeah, you're you're so you're so absolutely right. You're basically preaching to the choir here because this is a huge focus of of what I have learned from top real estate professionals. We've gosh interviewed hundreds of them from all over the country uh, over the years, and and this idea of of, of being of service. Um, this this idea not just during the transaction because the transaction is is usually a very small percentage of the overall time that you have with the relationship uh, with somebody in your database, right? They really they need you when they need you. And, and then there's a lot of time in between. And this idea of how do I provide value in between um, is, is really the best question you could ever ask yourself for repeat business and referrals, right? I, I, or I'm, I'm sorry, that's my uh, my thought. Curious if, if what, what you're- No, that's is. definitely my thought. The, the only thing is like, I, when I talk, when I talk, I'm in a room with, with hundreds and thousands of agents. I often they're like, that's so much work. And I'm like, yeah. it doesn't have to be if you use technology. This is what technology is for. I know so many agents don't like to use CRMs, but it's like, I've, I've led large sales organizations at companies. And it's like, there's a reason, like there's only two rules I have when I read sales. One is if you're, you're the top salesperson, I don't care. And if you're number two on down to a thousand, if it's not in the CRM, it doesn't exist because right. that's the path to success. It, as an individual entrepreneur that it's your business, you need to treat yourself the same way because, hey, this will remind you. I mean, my wife and I use Trello to manage our entire household or houses. Like I have an errands and buy list. So when I go to Home Depot or Lowe's, that's one card. There's a checklist in there about what you need to pick up. I don't even know what's on the list sometimes because I didn't add it. Well, it's it's a self-reminding system that I trust. Now, you don't have to use that. You can use a CRM. But when you use technology, then you trust it. Well, then look, I mentioned, hey, follow up with that person about the uh, about do they want to remodel their bathroom? Two years down the line, your system will remind you about it. You've taken it out of your mind. It's effortless at that point. It's a 15 second phone call. Yes. And if if it's if it's stuck in your mind, if the to do is not automated, um, I, I, we use Trello as well for our podcast. So it's just kind of, um, you know, uh, we, our entire podcast, the entire workflows on Trello. I use Todoist for 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 my reminders, um, but but I have I have the same thing. I put every single and and this doesn't make me like a great friend um, necessarily, but it's something that I'm just saying not not to brag, but just so that anybody can do this. Um, whatever system you might be using or not not using, you should you should definitely get one. Is you should put all of your clients' birthdays in in your CRM. You should put you know maybe their um their their wedding anniversaries if you have that sort of relationship with them where you want to contact them. All of this can be automated because it's the same it's funny I, I i have the same i have this one philosophy when i go to see a doctor because i know my memory is garbage and i know that every year i'm supposed to go to the dermatologist and just get checked out head to toe you know it seems like the the thing i'm supposed to do or or getting your teeth cleaned every six months right. or whatever whatever the routine is but i know there's no way i'm going to remember when's the last time i had I went to see the dermatologist i'd have to look at my calendar so before i leave <laughs> the, the the last appoint my appointment when i see them i'm like i need to make an appointment from a year from now so yeah. basically but that's like a manual way to do it um what Kurt's really talking about is utilizing technology to remind you, you know, or, or I could put it into Doist every year, remind me to get my dermatologist right. appointment. But the idea is if I don't have it down and if I'm not utilizing or leveraging technology, I'm just unlikely to remember to do it, quite honestly. Well, not just you're unlikely. You're, our brain is programmed to be lazy. 
I mean, there, you know, I, I'm blessed with being able to sleep very few hours a night. And so I basically can keep two full-time jobs my whole life. It drives my wife crazy. Um, but the, cause she's asleep and I've been up for six more hours still cranking away at things. But the, um, but even there, your brain doesn't want to do hard work. I mean, there's some level where it's like, I think we are kind of intended to be a pack mule in some ways where my job, you know, I'm happier when I'm working and things, but I will forget things. I will procrastinate. I will, I will think things are important when they're not. So one of the reasons I like these systems are not like they allow me to take 80% of my stuff off my plate and go, this isn't important. Hey, I might have a follow-up with a client and doesn't mean I have to do it today. It stays on the list. I push it down because there's something else that's more important to do today. And, but the system will come back and remind me of it. And so like, I'm going to lie to myself. You're going to, your brain's going to lie to yourself too. And totally. go, hey, you don't need to do this. Your business is going to grow if you follow, if you don't follow up. And it's like, no. So like, it's a pre-decision, a pre-fight with yourself or whatever. So. And, and what's nice is, is you were saying, and I think you, you said this, and I just want to step on this point a little bit more because I really think you're touching on something really important is, you know, if you don't have things systematized, everything becomes quite emotional um, when it occurs to you to do it, like you were saying, and your, your brain will lie to you and say, this thing just came in to my mind. It's the most important thing in the world because it's got my attention. Is it actually the most important thing or is it just what you're reacting to in the moment? Well, if you don't have systems in place, there's no real easy way to determine how important and urgent is this particular thing that I'm thinking of doing. Um, if you have systems, the emotional part gets out and and you just sort of go, oh, okay, today I have to call so-and-so and wish him a happy birthday. Yeah. Or I have to call and say, oh, it's been 24 months. I'm going to say, hey, have you thought about you know remodeling? I just wanted to touch base. I wanted to make sure I was paying attention to what you guys are up to. Um, you know, Here's an idea for you. Um, but if you have to think to remember to do all of this, you're just you're not going to remember number one and number two, it's going to feel like this big emotional thing. Whereas you're just following, you know, a, a series of, of to do's that you have set up. Um, and this, it, it, it just, it, it becomes a lot less emotional energy, I think. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And the systems, when you use the reports on them, let you be true to yourself because, yeah. Hey, I, I, I actually hate the, well, I, I do work tons of hours. I hate the hustle attitude because like I enjoy what I do. So it's not work. I don't want to watch Netflix. I want to come down and write a 700,000 word blog post because I thrive on stuff like that. But like the systems, like even if you come down to your watch, like every system says how much, if you try tracking, how much did I go to the gym? How much did I walk? Right. How much did I swim? You will always drastically underestimate like, like 20 to 60% how much activity you did compared to what you actually did. So the end of the week, this will tell me that I actually walked what I said I was going to walk. Same thing if you're using your CRM, that I actually make the phone calls. My business growing, I don't care. If it's not growing, the system will let you go back. You can go to Pipedrive, Salesforce, KV Core, and see what have I actually done in here. If I take up a, take a phone call that's at random, I can put it in there and then see, oh, well, I thought I was very busy, but apparently I wasn't very productive because when I look at the KV Core report, I don't actually see that I've done very many follow-ups from it. And so it's both on the day-to-day -day manager you're talking with. And for me, the huge thing that's been beneficial for me is that kind of weekly review that says, God, the, the system doesn't say that I've actually done as much as I thought. That's mm -hmm. actually reality, not what's in here. Yeah, I love that. I, I want to uh, ask you about what, what you call high achieving servant leadership. Can you tell us a little bit about, and I'm going to say again, high achieving servant leadership. I love that name. Um, I'm curious of what that means to you and, and just if, if you don't mind talking about it. Yeah. So I, I've worked for a lot of non-servant leaders before. So servant leadership is instead of a hierarchical approach about working on a team. I know a lot of your listeners are individual agents, but you may have VAs, maybe trying to build a team. So it's like when you're doing that, it's different between I'm leading from authority where I tell you to do this or you're fired. At some level, that's always the that, that's always what comes out, as opposed to the servant leadership is, look, I'm here to serve the people that are working for me. We have clients we're serving, we have people we're serving. Nobody's ever going to work as hard because this is my business. I own it. I own the brokerage. And so if, if at that level, like it's a completely reframed. My job is here to work not because I want money. That's an end result if I've done the right things of uh, serving people. But the high achieving side is most of the, if you look at the books that people have written, most of them, I don't disagree with this. I'm a strong believer, but most people have written books from a faith perspective. They're doing it because they believe, you know, it's part of Christianity. It's part of Judaism. It's part of Islam about how do you serve others? So they're writing the books from that standpoint. 
But if I go read Cheryl Backelder's book, strong Christian believer, she turned around Louisiana, Louisiana's Popeye's, uh, uh, Popeye's kitchen, like through this attitude, she says, if you want to make a crap ton of money, this is how you do it. And that's like the only real book I've seen. So I try bringing that to people being like, look, it also sucks to be a hierarchical leader and be a dictator and a micromanager. But if I'm here to serve you, then you're going to show up and, and do more than I could ever ask because you love the job. Yeah. And, and you can apply this to your, to your customers. You can, I mean, because you, you are, you, you are, uh, you know, well, I, my, my friend, Joel, uh, who is one of the top mortgage, uh, one of the top loan officers in the country, he says, givers get, um, yeah. and his whole, his whole philosophy goes, I never think about what I'm going to get. Um, and as a result, he goes, I end up getting more than I could ever imagine, but it all starts with giving. And, and so this idea, whether you're a boss, a team leader, um, whether you're just individual practitioner and you want to do this for your clients, being a servant is, is something, and again, a servant in, in, in a way, again, I want to make sure we're not uh, suggesting that you give up your, your, your boundaries, your identity, or you become at somebody's beck and call. No, you think about what would provide value for that person. Mm -hmm. And, and you just work on it. I mean, this is the reason why influencers have, especially in real estate, a lot of realtors have figured out, boy, if I create YouTube videos that for, for things in my, you know, geographic area that I service that are maybe not real estate related. Maybe they're like, Hey, I'm thinking about moving to Wicker park. What should I know? Right. That might not be a real estate specific question, but that's a pretty important question for somebody that's looking to move to a certain neighborhood or they right. want to know, like, what's it like to live there? What are the pros? What are the cons? And I've seen a lot of influencers really dive into this and say, I'm not going to talk too much about real estate. I want people to know that I'm the expert in this particular area. And the way I'm going to do that is by, by talking about the pros and cons. A lot of people have, have made careers out of doing this, where this becomes their primary mode of marketing, whereas they really jump into this, how do I provide value to people who are wanting to move or into my local market? Yeah, I, it's the difference between networking and net weaving. Networking is there is usually some I, I'm talking to these people to get something for me and the end result versus the net weaving is I'm, just, I'm looking for people in the sphere that I'm working in, seeing how I can help them. And like, you know, and or just take something off of their plate, not with any return anticipated to come for it. And you're right, you know, usually givers get as well. I mean, like, hey, I have a property in North Georgia that I need an appraisal on, not a CMA. I need a legal value appraisal from. I have to go do work. I'm going to have to go do work for that to make sure I pick the right company, the right person to come and do that. God, somebody that steps up and just says like, hey, I know I'm not getting a transaction out of this, but I have an appraiser that you're going to love. Can I introduce you? It'll be a seamless, seamless for you. Like that's a way that people step in and help where it's really easy. Like that, that may be a 12 second phone call. I'll probably make a couple calls after this to ask for some recommendations. Somebody like in my sphere, a few people know that's going on. That's a 12 second call for them to make an introduction that of course, like I'm going to remember that person because they saved me an hour of work. Yeah, boy, you you and I are just so simpatico on this. I I am I'm such a such a fan of of everything you're saying. This idea of being of service and and thinking of ways to continue to be of service in between the transactions is really is really the key, right? So if 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 nothing else that that uh, people got from from this uh, this conversation, and I know people got a lot from it, but if nothing else, just constantly wake up every day and say, how can I be of service to people in between transactions? What information are they looking for? How can I make their lives a little easier? And how can I automate that? Like you were saying, how do I use technology so that I'm not having to make 50 phone calls a day um, or, or or send out 50 individual emails a day when I can maybe automate some of that? That. And, and, you know, the showcase IDX actually does a lot of this as well. Um, so this idea of, of utilizing technology to really systematize and automate some of your, your stuff. I mean, we have 750 brokers at, at our company. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of, of constantly trying to say, we, we, tr every day we try to say, what could we send out to our agents today that would help them in their business, right? right? It's the same kind of conversation. Um, you know, it's not going, Hey, where's your next transaction? How come you haven't done a deal in a while? You know, th those kind of micromanaging type types of strategies. We're like, well, we want people to just to say, wow, Kale gave me another great idea today about yep. how I could grow my business. Or, you know, if, if it's a homeowner, wow, some, you know, my, my realtor just said, Hey, if you're thinking about rehabbing your, your bathroom, um, 
give me a call. I have some thoughts about that. Like that's huge, huge stuff. So um, anyway, I, I think this is a great place to wrap up. I, I'm just a, such a huge fan of yours, Kurt. Um, I want everybody who's listening to really, really Kurt's a guy you should follow. He's an industry leader. So across multiple industries, he's built many, many, many successful companies. He's oftentimes brought in as a consultant to turn companies around and take them to the next level. He's a guy you absolutely should be paying attention to. So please go to his website. And by the way, he's a speaker. If you're, you know, if like, I, I volunteer uh, with the Chicago Association of Realtors. We're always looking for speakers. If you're part of your local association, Kurt works with associations. He works with everyone. So definitely keep him in mind. Um, he would love to come, you know, to talk to your brokerage or, you know, talk, of course, with your association. Or if you're looking for some business consulting, you know, if, if he can't help you, he'll know who can. Um, but definitely reach out to him. Go to his website, which is KurtEuler.com. Again, that's K U R T. U H L I R. And by the way, Kurt, I wanted to mention, I'm sorry, .com, Kurt Euler.com. I, I interrupted myself, but you were mentioning when you used to live in Wicker Park, uh, which is funny because there's a you know a million neighborhoods in Chicago. It's just funny coincidence. I actually currently live about three and a half blocks due east of you. So I'm at uh basically division and Ashland, uh just oh, a nice. little bit west of that. Yeah. So we were literally uh we, we were when you lived here, we were just uh well, I didn't live there at the time, but you know, just yeah, yeah. a few blocks from each other. So That's a great place. Uh, area well really lo lovely and lots of fun um well kurt th thank you so much i want everyone to go to kurt's website kurt euler.com learn about him follow him he's got so much great stuff and he's always uh he's always popping up in, in in different industry events and so please check him out he's amazing kurt thank you on behalf of our audience for for being on our show um, as as well, on behalf of Kurt and myself, we want to thank the audience for sticking around to the end of the show. Hopefully everyone got a tremendous amount of value. I know you did. Um, and show Kurt some love. Visit his website. Reach out to him. Ask him questions. He's he's fantastic and he's a giver. Uh, he's 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 here to serve as well. Um, so on behalf of uh, of the audience, Kurt, again, thanks. And we'll want to just real quickly before we leave, please. The way only thing we ask of our listeners is tell a friend. Think of one other realtor that could benefit from this great conversation about systematizing and being of service. Um, this conversation with Kurt. Send them a link to our website. Uh, which is keeping it real pod.com. Every episode we've ever done can be streamed there. Or if the person you're referring to uh, is a podcast listener, just have them pull up any podcast app, search for keeping it real and hit that subscribe button. Uh, Kurt, thank you so much. And we will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks for having me. Uh -huh.